Thank you so much for kicking off the day, Shane. I know that the morning time slot is not always the easiest, but I really appreciated the visual aids that you included to demonstrate how visually mobile payments users are engaging with these types of applications. I know that in my experience, when I have been doing interviews and case studies with millennials and Zoomers in particular, the user interface and how it looks on their phone, if it's not mobile friendly, you generally speaking have less than five seconds before they will switch to another methodology. So that's an interesting data point if you wanna take that back with you to your organizations. There's a really short half-life if the UX isn't aligned with the consumer's expectations. Our next speaker this morning is Jed Rice from Alias Wire. And while the title of his presentation says something along the lines of fighting fintechs, even though I work at a fintech, he promised he wouldn't fight me and that he left his lightsaber at home. So we're good there. Um, and Jed, if you are ready to come to the stage, you have plenty to say. I am thrilled about your presentation. I read all the way through it. You all are in for some exciting data points and things that I think will be incredibly meaning for you this morning. Please welcome Jed to the stage. I, I think she's overbilled this as exciting. So um, let's make sure I had to do this. So it's which button? The green one? Okay. So I, I actually modified this a little bit yesterday because there were so many good speakers um, in listening to them. And I wanted to focus less on the fighting part of it and more on the partnership part of it. Because, you know, there's every panel, Barry in his keynote, Alan in his keynote, they all frame this as being in the complexity of payments. Good partnerships are the key to that. And as I explain to people, um, you know, friends and colleagues and things like that about, you know, what it's like to work in payments as opposed to working in technology where you can do things. Uh, you can build something, you can market it, you can sell it, you can deliver it, you can support it. In payments, it's very unique. You cannot do anything on your own. It's an impossible business to be in unless you are standing shoulder to shoulder with partners on either side of you, in front of you, and back of you. And what makes it even more complex is a lot of times those partners are also competitors in some way. And so that focus on the conversation yesterday, the way that people talked about it, I thought, you know, thinking about fighting fintechs in a particular way, in a partnership way, but we're a fintech at the same time. Um, thinking about it more in the context of, uh, in the complexity of this business that we're on around payments, that um, strong relationships with other people will be successful for us. Um, it's also a way to make your partner successful um, and to play within this ecosystem in a positive way. So I thought what I would do is use the context of all this great conversation about partnerships uh, and think about it in a particular um, structure. So. A little bit about us. So we are a, you know, some folks within the company, it's not an official tagline, but we're a fintech who put the tech in fintech because really what we do is we work uh, extensively with our banking partners. Uh, here's a few of them on the list. There are some of uh, other banks and partners we have which are not public, a lot of them. Some are actually here. Um, so we have a long pedigree and experience of working with banking and financial institutions and other providers where we come in with a very specific solution, a specific approach to provide capabilities um, so that those partners can go to market. Uh, and it's important. And, and somebody said it yesterday, I don't know if it was Barry or Alan in particular, who said, you know, with partnerships, smaller providers and bigger providers, uh, we clearly are the innovation arm of that. We move quickly, we make changes, we launch capabilities, and we look at being uh, a partner to these large institutions because they need that as part of their strategy. They provide us distribution and reach. And if we do this the correct way, there's a lot of value in it for both of us. So the key thing to think about here is, and, I, and this used to say the fintech threat is imminent, I changed it to the disruptor because that's really what it is for us in the payments business. It's a third party coming in and trying to disintermediate a relationship, disintermediate a service. They see an opportunity to make money and if they can drive a wedge between an existing legacy provider, existing legacy relationship and a customer for their own benefit, they're going to do that. And that's what's going on and we're going to talk about this specifically in this context of uh, really around receivables, a place where banks have played a long and predominant role is helping organizations to bring revenue and money into the business. 
So the actual management and processing of receivables and whether that comes into the form of card-based transactions, lockbox, cash, whatever it is, banks play a very prominent role in that. And there are a lot of folks that are coming into the space, and they have been for a number of years, who want to sit in the middle of that process. And they can do that, frankly, by providing a great service. Um, they go in and they provide, for example, uh, here's the presentation of your digital bill. Here you can log into an account. Here you can manage budget billing. You can manage uh, pay with different mechanisms. You can set it up so that it'll automatically pay with my credit card if it's under a certain amount, but it's over a certain amount, and I'll pay with it, uh, an ACH transaction. And providing that level of service and capabilities is great for the user. It's great for the actual um, organization who's sending out the bills and um, the statements that need to be paid. Uh, but it does disintermediate the legacy providers who have been doing this stuff in the banks. When you disintermediate a relationship in one aspect of it, you create the opportunity to disintermediate the entire relationship. So once you start to lose a foothold with a, with, a, with a customer and they go somewhere else for part of the service you've been providing, it becomes a higher likelihood that they're going to go start looking for other capabilities that you currently serve them in other areas as well. So we want to really focus on the fact that there's a part of this that we can help in our role is help the banks maintain that relationship. And it's meaningful. So we know that banks and financial institutions are seeing declining revenue. Interest fee revenue has disappeared. They're not seeing the ability to transition into transaction fee revenue, occur, you know, annual recurring revenue. All those things that we think about as technology providers and we're measured on, banks don't think about it that way. And there is revenue bleeding out of that system at a rapid rate that's going to these disruptors and these other organizations. And I think the quote here is great because it really talks about the fact that you have to stop the bleeding. You've got to react to this because if it doesn't, it gets going to get worse and worse. And so thinking about this as a financial institution and realizing that they have to have changes here um, because otherwise we're going to start to see that hemorrhaging increase becomes critical. And so when you think about this as an institution where you've got longstanding established relationships, uh, one of the ways that we want to come in and help solve this is by making sure that sticky relationship around receivables exists. I thought Barry was really, you know, talked a lot about this yesterday and the transformation of Deluxe in particular. Um, you know, their market share of checks are growing, but the market for checks is declining. And it's because more people are shifting to Deluxe, but overall that market's coming down. And their transformation into being more of a digital provider is really critical and they represent what other banks and financial institutions should be doing. This is an example of just how we work with Citi. So Citi has a very comprehensive bill pay solution, presentment payment, et cetera, called Present and Pay, and we power a good chunk of that. We power that not only with our platform in particular, but we help enable things like MasterCard Bill Pay Exchange. We provide the plumbing for that to work within that environment. Uh, we provide them with Spring by City, some other capabilities we have. We provide all the hooks from the receivables into those systems. So we sit behind the scenes and make a lot of these things happen from an orchestration standpoint because City's a big organization. They've got a tremendous overhead. They are thinking about bigger issues around cross-border, international, servicing very large Fortune 500, 100, 10, 5 companies with their comprehensive banking needs having somebody like us who can come in and quickly adapt and turn around with a team and say, oh, you want Microsoft, I'm sorry, you want MasterCard Bill Pay Exchange, yep, we can have that in 90 days, it's going to be plugged in, fully certified, we're going to worry about doing that with MasterCard, et cetera, we'll turn it on for you. And they can do that a lot faster than what you can imagine the, C, uh, the city IT and development organization could do. And all of this should lead to really tangible results. If as a bank and a financial institution, you can go in and start paying attention to what your existing customers want or your prospective customers, it should start to drive numbers. So this is some data we've been able to drive off of our platform in servicing our bank clients uh, for a number of years. So one of these is, is just in that first initial period, our bank partners immediately pick up new clients. It's because they may have gone into somebody and said, hey, we provided you with banking services. And they may say, yeah, but I need to move from lockbox to digital payments. You didn't have that, but you have it now. Great. That sort of closes the loop for me. It also means that they can go out there and more aggressively talk about a broader strategy. So we're a component of that more digital capability that a bank or financial institution may have. 
And if we start to become a successful one and we provide value, then we can help drive even more customer acquisition after that. And we've had great examples of some banks who've approached this, this transformation, this transition really aggressively, where their new customer acquisition rate reached 700% growth in four years. So there is, by the way, not to downplay it, an obligation and a, and a responsibility from the bank to execute on this as well. So no, we don't just come in and drop it in and they're successful. There's a lot that we do in terms of hand-holding um, and marketing and training to make them successful. So this is a particular one who paid attention to that strategy and executed well. The other thing that comes on as, as the waterfall continues is not only are we going out and helping those financial institutions to acquire more direct customers, and for us it's the commercial banking customers that these banks acquire, it allows those folks to go out then and bring more people onto the system. So for example, uh, we, we provide digital accounts receivable and payments capabilities for John Hancock through City. John Hancock then goes out and provides uh, a online digital experience for paying your premiums and other things. John Hancock then be able to, is able to drive an enhancement in digital money movement, which then flows through John Hancock and through the bank as well. So what we see here is an increase in digital payment transactions overall. The greater the digital payment transactions that occur, the stickier the relationship is between the consumer, I'm sorry, the customer, whether it's B2B or B2C and John Hancock. John Hancock being sticky with Citibank, the money that flows through that, it opens up for Citi to be able to offer even more banking services related to that. So the flow of money by the user is important, and we see that represented here, right? So the dollar volumes we see flowing through the system. Um, so we see by adding the accounts receivable piece and putting in the right components, the right experience, the right capabilities for the biller, John Hancock, and the payer, whether it's you as an individual or your businesses, uh, we see a, a, a significant adoption in digital payment movement. So we help in that transition from the physical to the digital. And again, when you create that dollar flow that comes through it, it opens up the opportunity to start thinking about additional digital services um, related to that. And all of this is related to the idea that we want to create sticky relationships. So instead of losing those, uh, those discrete pieces of uh, transactions and services out to these disruptors, what you're doing is creating more and more reasons for that customer to stick with you. Uh, we have almost a 100% client retention rate for the customers who come on to us from a bill payment standpoint over 10 years. So it is an incredibly sticky relationship that a John Hancock or an Aetna or an Alight um, or a Southwest Gas, when they put the system on, they stick with it, and they stick with it in a really uh, reliable and predictable way. The key thing for us is, yeah, we get to talk about that as alias wire, but it's not our customer. It's the bank's customer. Because we're providing the service through them, it's them retaining the relationship with those, with those, um, those commercial customers. And so if you think about the capabilities that you're looking at, so for example, Remote deposit capture is declining because checks are declining, but text to pay, and Shane talked a little bit about this, is rising because of the convenience of it. If you're responding that way and you're giving um, your commercial customer and their customers these enhanced ways to follow the way that um, behavior is changing, that's where you keep that customer retention rate. So it's not only putting the system in place, but being flexible and responsive and maintaining it. And those are things that we can do as a technology provider that a bank may not be able to do quite as quickly and as aggressively. So when you think about putting all these pieces together, and you think about the fact that you as a financial institution have to look at this being an example of a component of the overall relationship that you have, that becomes the, the, the basis for you to maintain and grow that existing relationship. And all of that falls into pieces of this where can we make the money move faster? Can we make it more accurate? Can we make it more reliable um, for everybody within that ecosystem? And the more that you do that as a legacy provider of broader capabilities, the less reason somebody's going to go find a disruptor who can do those things um, outside of your system. Um, so hit all those points. 
think about it the right way, find a partner to be able to do it. Because I said before, at the end of the day, it's not really our customer, it's yours as the bank. Um, if you look at folks like us who have a very, uh, and there are other folks that are out there that do this, uh, if you look at folks like us who want to focus on the technology, you want to th we want to think about the experience, we want to think about rapid development, we want to think about the capabilities that a financial institution needs, the financial institution's customer needs, the end user needs, and we're going to build that comprehensive solution for you. Uh, look to us to be the partner that's going to think about solving your business's problems as well. And so if we can do that on that partnership standpoint um, and in, in this you know, sort of complex payments ecosystem, um, that's the way that you keep the, the disruptors at bay. So look beyond um, just the technology stack and the services that are being provided and look more for the mentality and the approach and the focus. Um, that's going to end up being a critical part of this. Okay, so I think we're way ahead, right? I either talk so fast or we all are. So, questions, comments, challenges? Easy one. Yes? What do you see in your experience as some of the biggest barriers to fintechs or disruptors and traditional financial institutions coming together at the table and establishing that collaboration? You highlighted a couple of points yesterday during our talk that I think could be salient for the members of the audience. Sure. Um, you know, when, when you do, somebody like us who goes and works with a bank, um, one of the things that we've worked really hard at, at, at discovering and responding to is um, understanding the challenges that banks face internally in providing new innovative services um, and being able to address those as a partner. And I, and I hinted at this a little bit by saying, hey, you know, one of the things is technology. The other part of it is you have to lead the bank to be successful. Um, Citibank I talked about, but there are lots, we do a lot with regional banks and super regional banks, et cetera. And as you move down from the size of the financial institution, their resources start to shrink. They become a little more limited. They have less budget, they have fewer people, um, their infrastructure tends to be uh, more rigid. They get a core banking system from FIS and it runs the way FIS tells them the core banking system works. Um, or Fiserv or Jack Henry, or that might be. And they have less flexibility in thinking about innovation. We approach this by um, trying to come into this with a total solution sort of out of the box. And what that means is uh, when we go in, we talk to the CIO and we say, hey, listen, this solution sits outside of your infrastructure. This is an offering we bring to your commercial banking customers that flows directly between their systems through ours and back to their systems. Maybe we're doing, uh, we're plugging into your ACH gateway. Uh, maybe we're providing you some data for your overall billing for the relationship, your account analysis system. But other than that, we're not touching anything with it. Number two is we can go to the product management team and lay out for them the full comprehensive capabilities of the product. Um, we have enough capabilities and flexibility to adjust that, to think about how that particular bank may need it. Some folks, folk, you know, have a, a particular banks think a lot about HOA or government or municipality or utilities or things like that. And the platform allows them to think about how they, they market that. Number three is um, we provide an extensive set of capabilities, all white label and subject matter expertise to allow the marketing and salespeople to go out and, and demonstrate this. You know, if you look at all of the material behind City Present and Pay, if you look at everything that union banks presenting, if you look at what BMOs uh, presenting, 95% of that has actually been created by us. All the technical specifications, the value propositions, the white papers, et cetera. And we provide that as capability so they can go out and actually present that to their customers. And the last thing that we do is we do, well, two more things. Uh, the last part of that sales and marketing process is we provide all of the technical sales ability. So the treasury management sales folks go out and they engage those customers, either new ones or longstanding ones. They foster the relationship. But when it comes to doing the demonstration, showing how it works, all those things, we do that. Uh, a lot of times we do that wearing a bank T-shirt so that folks know that we're part of that team as well. And finally, the last thing we do is we run the entire operations for them. Um, so every flow of information, every data point, every piece that gets presented to them, to that banking customer and eventually the, the, the user of it, flows across our system and we manage everything from technical support 
to bugs to customer support and everything else. So it really comes out of the box. You have to approach that with lots of financial institutions because if you, the minute you start to touch core, you're adding two years to the cycle. The minute you're going to ask them to create marketing material, it's going to add to regulatory reviews. The minute you're going to go ask to go train those salespeople who are already carrying a big bag full of stuff, uh, they're going to lose distraction because then you start worrying about, okay, how are they being compensated? How are they being paid? And all the rest of those things that get associated with that. The more you can take off the table and, and simply provide a turnkey solution to them, the more successful you can be in servicing those mechs. That was a long-winded answer, but it was a good question. Yes? Yeah, we're completely a platform as a service. Yes. Oh. I will. Yes, thank you, Mom. Uh, the question was, is how do we work with the bank? How do we operate or interoperate with that financial institution? So we're a total platform as a service. Uh, like I said, the only pieces we may touch are an ACH gateway. We may touch their account analysis so we can provide billing information to them. But we do what I call as commercial integration. We plug into the product team, the marketing team, the sales team, um, but we don't touch any infrastructure whatsoever. We go and talk to John Hancock's billing system so that we can pull out the billing data and present it digitally. We talk to John Hancock's accounts receivable system so we can post payments and keep them posted, informed of those things. We'll do reporting and analytics that we'll push out to the banks so they can keep traffic, track of it, but they just simply download or access that from a web portal. So it allows us to be very, very clean when we go into that financial institution. Other questions? Yes. Sure. So one of the nice things about bill payment and presentment is a relatively mature solution and, and, and approach. We've been doing bill payment and presentment for 20 years at this point. We operate in what's called the direct biller or biller direct model where we're creating that very clear relationship between a John Hancock and their users, which is about 75% of where folks pay bills today. In that maturity, what we're able to do is very much create a clean um, uh, integration point. So we're able to take very simple bill data that comes out of that biller uh, and be able to convert that into an interactive digital experience very cleanly inside of John Hancock's uh, user experience. So if you log in as a John Hancock user and you want to pay your bill, they call us to present that information within that infrastructure. And it's actually fairly straightforward to be able to do that. We do some single sign-on and things like that. When it comes to payments, there's also been a fairly robust movement towards digital payments infrastructure. So when we manage the processing of those payments and the movement of money outside of that, all we're then doing is settling on a daily basis and providing reporting and analytics back into that for the settlement purposes. So not overly complex, but we've matured the platform, so it's also quite easy for us to do that. For us, we can, we can activate a biller in anywhere from 15 to 45 days and most of that time, as my head of implementation will tell you, is waiting for a response from the customer and not actually doing any work. Yes? Could you speak to the um, kind of value and, and ROI, more of a timeline associated with that, against the different sizes of, of, of banks? So you mentioned smaller banks don't have much resources, so you're kind of monthly, it seems like, a lot of that. Yep. Yeah, and, and it's a good question. I'll, I'll, the question was, what's the ROI, the turnaround, or the, or the value benefit for the bank, depending on the sizes of those things? So one thing I'll talk real quickly about is, well, how do we make money on this? So we have a very clean kind of upfront implementation fee. We have a, a, a monthly um, uh, hosting fee or application fee, and then everything after that is transactions. Uh, and we effectively just deliver a buy rate to our banks. Um, and they then do with it what they want. There are lots of uh, partners who have gone out and pursued big, brand new 
enterprise customers where frankly they may discount our stuff heavily as part of the overall win of the package. There are other places where we look like a point solution and they may mark it up you know, because they see more margin in those things. So it depends a little bit on how they decide to go to market. Uh, there's not a huge investment up front for us. We're talking not about you know, hundreds of thousand dollars, we're talking about tens of thousand dollars sort of as the initial investment. And then we ask for people's time and support to be able to do those things. Uh, it really depends, the value depends on how fast they're willing to get up and moving. One of the goals that we have, uh, and this is one of the stated objectives that we really push for in our partner onboarding is, we want them to be live with their first customer within 90 days of closing the agreement with us. So during the initial process, even before we sign the contract, we're saying, let's go and find prospects. Let's talk to customers who you already have on board. Let's start looking at how we can introduce this to some of them. And then we move that quickly through the process once that's done. Because we want to be able to show them that an investment here will have a direct return on benefit soon after that. One of the, one of the partners we're starting with now got super aggressive with it. And we have, we have 15 prospects for them uh, and we don't expect to sign the final agreement with them until Labor Day. Um, so they're starting to embrace this, and it has to be an aggressive approach to them to want to go out and pursue this. So their, their success, their participation um, is a big driver of that. You know, there's, we talk about the fact there's, we, we can't push a rope, right? We can put everything out there, we can do the best we possibly can to lead them to be successful, but they have to act on that as well. There's a question back. Yes, sir. So, so the question was, is given the sheer number of disruptive fintechs out there and the sheer number of banks and the sheer amount of noise that's going on in this industry, is how do you, how do you find an opportunity to go in there um, and be heard by them? So you're talking about us and being successful with banks or as a fintech in general? Yeah, and, and I think it goes to the fact that, you know, a lot of what I talked about here is you have to go in there with the right answer. Go in there and say, hey, it's not just about we have a great technology platform, we have this great ability to allow that biller and that customer to have a great relationship. Hey, bank, this is fee-based revenue. It's transaction-based revenue. The, R the, the resource commitments for you are limited. The ROI, therefore, will be faster. You're thinking about the fact that they're trying to run their business. They're trying to maintain customer relationships, they're trying to reduce churn, they're trying to increase the average revenue per customer, they're trying to do that with limited budgets, limited resources, limited capabilities in a noisy market. So the more that you can take off the plate for them and just manage for them, the better. I mean, sort of we joke a little bit about, you know, that meme kind of thing of walking into the bank is, you want more customers? Hold my beer, right? We'll go take care of that for you. Uh, and that's what we really try and do. We really try and go in there and show them that we, if they trust us, and it goes back to trust we've talked a lot about, if they trust us to execute, we will deliver for them. Any other questions? Okay. One more. I just, I, I just have to say, that's the money quote of the day. You want more customers, hold my beer. <laughs> All right, that it? We're good? All right, thank you all very much. Appreciate it.